All right, welcome to the practice problems for instructions at Architectures 1. So the first problem here is a peer instruction problem. That means that you're going to work on your own first to come up with an answer. Then after you both got answers, you're going to discuss them together. And this is a review from the material we saw online. So remember, start out on your own, then only after you've both got written answers, go on and do them together. So here's the question. Now, go ahead and pause the video, answer the questions on your own, and discuss with your partner. Okay, so the questions were, what were three ideas from the ISA1 lecture? And you were supposed to have written down your own answers and discuss them with your partner. And now I'll tell you what the three that I had were. And of course, you may have had different ones, that's fine. So the first one was the MIPS assembly instructions. So we saw that the MIPS assembly instructions have this format. You have an opcode, you have a destination, and you have source registers or an immediate. We saw examples of this. For addition, we had the add instruction with the destination and the sources. We had add immediate if you want to put in a constant or an immediate field. And we had branch instructions that went along with that. So all of the instructions follow this sort of format. The second one I had is that MIPS operates only on registers. That is, we have to load and store to get data from memory. So you can't do an add on data. There's no way you could take this add up here and put in a location in memory. You have to first copy it into the register file. The third one I had was how memory works, how we store data in MIPS. And there were two ways we talked about. The first was the register file, which has 32 words, where each word is four bytes, but only 32 of them, and then the main memory. And the main memory supports up to 4 billion bytes or 4 gigabytes. So those are the three ideas that I had. You may have had different ones. All right, let's go on to the next problem. So this is again a peer instruction problem, and it's about MIPS register file access. So again, solve it on your own. After you've written down your answer, go ahead and discuss it with your group. So go ahead and pause the video, answer on your own, and discuss with your partner. Okay, so let's go through this problem. How many reads and writes does the MIPS register file need to be able to do for one instruction? And I gave you a hint, there are a bunch of instructions here that you could look at. So the answer is we need to be able to do two reads and one write. So let's analyze these instructions and see how we can figure that out. So the first instruction needs to be able to write one value, the result R3, and read one value R5, but it also uses another value. But this value is an immediate, it doesn't come from the register file. So for this instruction here, we need one write and one read and a constant or an immediate. For this instruction here, slightly different, we need one write and two reads, but no immediate or constant. For branch equal, well, we got two register files we need to access and then this loop part here. So that's we read two register file entries and we need to be able to read an immediate. And for an instruction like jump done, all we need here is a constant. So if you look across here, what we need in the worst case, we need to be able to write one and read two. So two reads and one write. All right, now you're gonna do a practice with executing instructions. What you see here is in the memory, we have three instructions and the program's gonna start at zero and start executing that. And see what we have for values in the register file. And this program is supposed to execute the following computation here. And so your job is now to go through with your partner and answer this. So pause the video, work with your partner to figure out how all these instructions go through, what the control does, the instruction register does and the ALU. All right, so let's take a look at how this works out. So we start off with the program counter at zero, which means we're gonna load from memory the first instruction, first instruction. Now the first instruction is gonna be interpreted by the control, which is gonna tell the ALU do an add, and it's gonna tell the register file where to get the data from, from R4 and R5. So it's gonna add these values together, and then it's gonna write them into R1. Now, when we're done, the control is gonna tell the program counter to do PC plus four and go on to the next instruction. So now we're gonna be at instruction four, we're gonna go ahead and load the instruction from memory location four. And now the control is again gonna say do an add, but this time it's gonna use two different register file entries. So six and seven, as we can see in the instruction, we're gonna add them together. We're gonna to take the results of that and we're gonna store it into register two. So now we've got a five in register two. After the instruction is done, the control is gonna say, okay, go on to the next instruction. So do PC plus four. So we're gonna go from four to eight. When we get to eight, we're gonna load the next instruction. The next instruction is gonna tell the ALU to do a subtraction and which registers to access, register one and register two. It's gonna subtract them and it's gonna store the result into register three. So that's what the program went through. Now let's go on to the next instruction. This is another peer instruction problem. It's about storing offsets. So now go ahead, figure out answers on your own first. 
And after you've got the answer on your own, both have answers on your own, then discuss them together. All right, so let's go through this problem here. So the problem starts off, there's a variable A, which is stored in memory address 24. So in memory address 24, we have this A that we will care about. We wanna change its value to 512. So we're gonna to have to put 512 into memory address 24. And the question is, which of these combinations of, of values for the store word instruction are gonna do that? And that's the instruction we need to store the value into memory. So let's take a look at this. So store word, puts the value of R6, so whatever value is here, puts it into memory, and it puts it at the memory location that is this constant or immediate X plus this register value here. So we need to have this R plus five here be where we want to put it, and we need to have this R6 be the value we want to install. So R6 must be 512, it's the value we want memory, and R5 plus X must be 24. And there are two ways we can do that. We can either have X be zero and R5 have 24 in it, or we can have X be 24 and R5 have zero in it. So both of those will allow us to store the data we want into that location. All right, let's go ahead and practice some data movement instructions. Just like we did before, go through and work out what's gonna happen through this program as it executes with your partner. All right, so let's go through this one here. So we're gonna start off program counter zero. We're gonna load the first instruction. When we load the first instruction, the control is gonna become an add. Now this is an add immediate. So it's gonna get some of the data from register zero and the other data from the instruction itself from the immediate field here. We're gonna add the values of those together. We're gonna to store it into R5s. Now I put 24 into here. Then control is gonna tell us to do PC plus four and go on to the next value. Now we get another add I instruction. So for that I instruction, the control is gonna be add again. We're gonna add register zero and 512. So we'll do zero plus 512, and we're gonna store it here into register six. Now we've got 512 in there. Now the control is gonna tell the program counter to a PC plus four. We're gonna go on to eight. We're gonna load the instruction at eight, which is the store word instruction. The control for store word is gonna be an add. So the reason it's gonna be an add is because what we need to do for, control, for store word is we need to add up to compute the address. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add the value in R5 to zero, that's our immediate, we're gonna create those, that result, but we're not gonna store that into the register file. We're gonna take that result and we're gonna put it into the memory address. So we use the ALU to compute the memory address. That's gonna tell us where we're gonna access memory. And now we go ahead and we go to memory and we say, give us, sorry, we're gonna store into memory, store word to the memory, address 24, and we need to figure out where the data comes from. So we're gonna to go to register six, we're gonna take that 512, and now we can tell the memory what to do, to put 512 into address 24. And so that's executing the program. All right, now one thing that's a little bit confusing here is we said the memory is byte addressable and the register file is words. So how does this word, this 512 value, get fit into bytes in the memory itself? There, there's nothing particularly complicated about this. The word in the register file is four bytes. And so we're gonna take those four bytes and we're gonna put them into four bytes in memory. So if you notice here, the way we've drawn memory, it's every four bytes. So there are actually four bytes in here that we're gonna store it into. So it's just gonna take this 512 and it's gonna store it into memory that way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we just saw. We saw some data transfer before. So we had a variable A, which was stored at address 24 in the memory, and it starts with the value three. And we wanted to change that to 512. So you've probably all seen programs where you've done something like this. You've created an object called box, and maybe that object box has some parameters to it. It has a color, it has an X and a Y location, so we're defining a box. Now, when you, in your programming language, say, give me a new box, you're telling the computer, find me some place in memory where I can store this information about the box. For example, say we run this, and when you run it, it decides to give you a place in memory at address 24. Now let's see what that does. So here's our address and what we have there. So color is the first part of the box and our box is address 24. So at address 24, the first thing we're gonna have is color. So that's value three. Now the thing after that is gonna be the next part of box. So one word further at address 28, we're gonna have the next part of box or the X and that has a value zero. And then one word further after that, we're gonna have Y. So Y is the value that's in there there. So what this is showing you is that when we make a new box, we put it at a particular location, and now this A 
This A has the address of where the new box is. So this should look familiar to the sort of data access we've been doing. Now, if you execute the code a.color equals 512, you're going to tell it, figure out where address A is and write 512 into it. So that's the sort of assembly we've been looking at. So if we have A in R5, 24, and R6 has our new color 512, that's exactly what the store word we just did. So this is a very common pattern. You put where the object starts in your store word, and then you use the, the immediate offset to figure out which part of your object you want to access. OK, so here's another pure instruction question about storing values and doing additions in doing so. So read the program, read the question, answer it on your own first. When you both have your own answers, discuss it together, and then go on. So go ahead and pause the video. OK. So the question was here, we're going to do the following. We're going to go and we're going to update this field. So we're going to take this box and we're going to set each of these values to zero. So the question is, how many additions does the MIPS processor need to do that? Well, we've got three values here. So we're going to have to do three store words to set them all to zero. So R5 is telling us where our object is. And we're going to say at zero offset from R5, set it to zero. So that's going to do the first part. At four offset, set it to zero. It's going to do the second part. And at eight, that's going to do the third part. So we need to do three additions here. We need to do R5 plus 0, R5 plus 4, and R5 plus 8. And that's what we need to do for this. But there's a trick to this question. What do we need to do if we go from this instruction to the next instruction? So if this is the current instruction we're executing, say this is instruction 0, how do we get on to the next instruction, instruction 4? Well, remember, there's this PC plus 4. So each time we do an instruction, the MIPS processor has to do an, addition, an additional addition, which is PC plus 4. So we need three adds to go through the instructions, plus three adds to do the instructions, so a total of six. All right. Now I'm going to give you another pure instruction. Again, remember to solve it on your own first before you discuss it in your group about unaligned accesses. And for this one, we're going to look at this picture of the memory here. So we have memory addresses 0, 4, 8, and 12. And I've divided it up into bytes here. So each one of these eight bits of data. And in the memory, we have a location A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, which are starting on word 4 and word 8. Now, the goal of this is we're going to, want to work with the unaligned word, the word at address 5. So here's address 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We want the word which is B, C, D, and E. It starts at 5. It's not starting at this nice aligned address here. So go ahead and answer this first on your own, and then discuss it in your group. OK. So what do you need to do to load the unaligned data? Well, you're going to have to do all of these things here. There is no unaligned address in the load instruction, because remember, load instructions have to be aligned in MIPS. So we're going to have to use multiple loads. We can't load parts of things like this, so we're going to have to do multiple loads. We're going to have to put those in registers because we're going to get them in the wrong chunks. And then we're going to have to figure out how to put those registers together to get the full word that we want. Now, as you might have guessed, the next problem here is figuring out how to do the assembly code to do this. So your job is to figure out how do you load into register 3 the data B, C, D, and E. To help you out, there are a bunch of instructions that you can use. These instructions help you. You can use them. You don't have to use them. But please make sure you figure out what you need to do before you go and look at the instructions. So go ahead, pause the video, and work on this together with your partner. When you've got an answer, go ahead and continue. All right, so let's figure out how we're going to load this together. And this is a solution I came up with. There are other ways to do this. So we want to load this data here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load a big chunk of it. So I'm going to load at address 4 into register 2. So if I load at address 4 into register 2, I'm loading these words into register 2. So I'll have A, B, C, and D in register 2. Now, notice that's pretty close to what we want. We want B, C, D, and E, but I've got three of them there. All right, so next what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift it over. I'm going to shift register 2 over by 8 bits or 1 byte. So now in register 2, I have B, C, D, and 0. All right, now we're getting closer. All we need to do is figure out how to get an E into here. And to do that, I'm going to use this load byte unsigned from R4 and 8. So this is going to load only one byte. And so if I do this, it's going to load E. So now I've got in register 4, 0, 0, 0, E, and in register 2, B, C, D, and 0. 
Now I have to figure out how do I combine the two of these together. The way I chose to combine them together was with an or. So if I or b with zero, well, anything ORed with zero is itself. Think about ORing one with zero, you get one. ORing zero with zero, you get zero. So that'll give me the right thing. That'll now give me B, C, D, and E in there, which is the answer I want. You could have also used an ADD, because if I add something with zero, it's gonna be itself also. So there are a bunch of ways to go ahead and combine those together. All right, now let's do a peer instruction question about branching and MIPS. Remember, answer the question on your own first when you've both chosen your answers, then discuss it with your partner. So which instruction combinations are sufficient to do this? Well, as we saw in the lecture, you need a br conditional branch for figuring out what you're doing here, and you need an unconditional branch for hopping over the other part. So if you don't want to do the other part for skipping over it. But there's a question. Could you use a branch not equal or branch equal to make an unconditional jump? Is there some way to make sure that it's always not equal or it's always equal? And the answer is, of course there is. So you could say branch equal R0, R0. That will guarantee that you always branch because they're always equal and you'll get to the end. There's no way to guarantee that they're always not equal because you don't know what's in the register files, but you can always guarantee that they are equal and use branch equal. So you could also choose branch equal and make that work for this. Okay, so go ahead and practice branching in MIPS, convert this into MIPS assembly, go ahead, pause the video and start working on this together with your partner. Okay, let's take a look at how I converted this. There are other ways to write the code as well. So I start off and I do add i into r2, r5, and minus seven. So I'm computing b minus seven, and I'm computing this so I can then see if it's equal to a. So the next thing I'm gonna do is say branch not equal r4 and r2. So this is saying if the a is not equal to the b minus seven I just computed, if it's not equal, I'm gonna jump down to else. If it is equal, I wanna keep going through here. So here's my else. Then if it is equal, I'm gonna go ahead and do my add. So I'm gonna do R4 plus R4, R4 plus two gets stored into R4. Now that's great, but now I need to make sure that I don't accidentally do the else here. So I need to put in a jump to done. So I need to skip over that part and go to the end. Now, what do we do in the else? Well, the else is pretty simple. We just wanna do this last part here. We're gonna say A equals B. So I'm gonna take B, I'm gonna add zero to it, and I'm gonna get A from it. Now, could we have used branch equal instead of branch not equal here? Well, yeah, we could have. We just need to switch this around. We would have to do the else part first and then the if part afterwards. All right, here are two extra questions, which if you guys want to, you can go ahead and spend time on them. All right, so let's take a look at these questions. So this question is pretty straightforward except for one little trick. And the little trick is right here with this add. So we're trying to store a value into R0 but R0 is always zero. So this isn't gonna change R0. So even after doing this, the R0 here is still gonna be zero. That's the only trick here. This code here is very much like the code that we saw for loading the unaligned access, but you see how it's shifting here by 16? That means instead of accessing one that's unaligned by one, it's gonna access a byte that's unaligned by two. So this is gonna load from addresses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Whereas what we saw before it was off by one, so it would have loaded from 13, 14, 15, and 16. All right, so here's the last part of the assignment, and this is reflections on what you've learned and what you've done. So on your own, go through and answer these questions. What was most interesting and why was it interesting? Be specific about it. What was most boring and why was it not interesting? Again, be specific. And identify one thing you feel you don't quite understand. So go ahead, answer your questions on your own. When you've both answered them, go on to the next part. Okay. So here's the last part of the problem set. So swap your answers to question three. Write down what your partner found confusing and try to identify a different way to think about the topic or something to learn about it to make it less confusing. The goal here is for you to try and help your partner understand how they can get over that confusing part. And then finally, write down what your partner provided you to help you with your confusion. When you're done with that, you're all set. Thank you.